Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller. What happens when cyberbullying turns deadly? It's the summer of 2006 in St. Louis, Missouri. Lori Drew, the 49-year-old mother of teenager Sarah Drew, reportedly became concerned that their 13-year-old neighbor, Megan Meyer, was spreading false statements about her daughter. Lori Drew and her employee, Ashley Grills, created a fake MySpace account of a 16-year-old boy using the name Josh Evans. The fake profile was used to befriend and communicate with Meyer in a manner described as flirtatious. In a cyber hoax turned deadly, Lori Drew is indicted in a federal court in Los Angeles, and lives are changed forever. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene, where we take you beyond the yellow tape into the lives of first responders, investigators, and prosecutors who work true crime. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI assistant special agent in charge and former Army counterintelligence agent. And I'm Tracy Miller. I've been a prosecutor for 23 years. I've completed over 80 trials, and I've handled cases against violent criminals, including those who have committed domestic violence, juvenile sexual assault, and gang crime. On today's show is former Cyber Section Chief and Assistant United States Attorney Michael Zweibach. Mike is a co-founder of the law firms Zweibach, Fissett, and Coleman, and he has significant experience in complex commercial litigation and trial practice both in the state and federal courts across the country. He's an expert in cybersecurity and privacy, national security and digital cases, and government investigations and trial litigation. This is a very disturbing case on so many different levels, but really puts cyberbullying on the map in our society, and it's a good reminder on how our actions can impact people in ways we never could imagine. This case ticked me off so much when I learned about it, Gina. I know. It really incensed me as well. So let's go behind the crime scene with Mike Zweibach on the MySpace cyberbullying case. Mike, we all remember what it feels like to be a 13-year-old. We wanted to feel accepted. We wanted to feel loved. We wanted to feel normal. What can you tell us about Megan Meyer? So Megan was very much your typical 13-year-old, wanted to be liked, wanted, you know, the popular girls to like her, and wanted to be accepted by her peers, and uh, also struggled with the fact that she was 13, which, uh, of course, comes with a lot of a lot of difficulties just growing up and being a teenager at that particular point in time. Did she have a history of mental health issues? She started to develop some issues that seemed to indicate a possible uh, depression. She was in the middle of changing schools, and her mother had expressed concerns about her mental health around the time that this happened, and actually had expressed a lot of those concerns to Lori Drew, who was a mom of uh, a classmate of Megan's. That classmate was Sarah Drew, and what type of relationship did she have? They were neighbors, right? Well, they were neighbors by all accounts. At some point, they actually had a very close neighbor relationship where they went on trips together um, as families. And of course, Megan's mom had confided in Lori about Megan's condition. But at some point, uh, as teenagers are teenagers, there there seemed to be a falling out between Megan and, uh, and Lori's daughter. There was a concern by Lori that Megan may have said some things at school that were impacting her daughter. Where did Ashley Grills fit into the picture? So Ashley Grills was someone who had worked or worked with the Drew family, more sort of, you know, 19, 20, someone who was older, someone who should know better. Uh, by all accounts, and she seemed to act at the direction of Lori Drew when they decided to hatch this particular scheme to to bully Megan. Before they actually hatched this scheme, Megan's mother told Lori Drew that Megan had mental health problems? Yes. Multiple times confided in her in the fact that she was concerned that Megan's mental health was such that Megan may actually hurt herself. Lori Drew was well aware 
and I believe that the evidence at trial showed that Corey was well aware that uh, Megan was someone who was extremely vulnerable emotionally to this type of abusive conduct. Knowing that, how would you describe Lori Drew? How would I describe Lori Drew? I think she was extremely callous, um, you know, someone who acted with a great deal of intent. We frequently talk in the law about various different mental states um, in terms of, you know, what someone who engages in criminal behavior, you know, has to meet as part of the intent elements of a crime. And I always felt that the conduct of Ms. Drew was unbelievably willful and intentional in terms of trying to harm this young girl. Do you know why? Well, the, the motivations seem to start as, you know, sort of retribution for the fact that Megan may have said some things about Lori's daughter, but it went well beyond that. It, it went to a level of, she seemed to gleefully relish the fact that, uh, you know, Megan was being, that at some point Megan was going to be harmed by this, you know, that they could divulge it to the outside world, not just the online world as well. Because she confided in people, including her hairdresser, about what it was that she was doing. She seemed to have no regard for the fact that what she was doing was something that was, was something that was wrong. So what did she do? Well, she created, uh, at that point in time, you know, now we have various different social media platforms and Instagram and Facebook and other things. Uh, but at that point, the, uh, the, the original generation was MySpace, and, uh, which is very similar to Facebook. And she went on to MySpace and she created a fake account um, in the name of Josh Evans. And Josh was, uh, the profile that they created for Josh Evans was, you know, of a younger man, a teenage boy who was sort of a loner, who came from a dysfunctional family. They took a picture of someone else that they utilized to create the profile. And then they, you know, intentionally reached out to Megan in order to start a conversation in the hopes that she may like the boy. And I want to back up because there's some important facts. When they, when they registered on the website, on the MySpace online platform, they used username and password that was in, you know, intentionally trying to hide the fact as to who Lori Drew was or the operator of the account was. Uh, they knew that that was in violation of MySpace's terms of service. The terms of service of MySpace was also very specific about the fact that, you know, you couldn't utilize the platform for harassment, for any kind of emotional distress of another, uh, that you had to be truthful when you registered. And there were very specific terms of service about what it was that you could not do. And they intentionally went out to violate those terms of service when they registered, created this uh, fake and fictitious um, profile in order to ensure that they could capture Megan's attention. A 50-year-old woman goes through all of this just to capture the attention of a 13-year-old? Yes. Like, this motivation seems so hard to grasp. Beyond what you would, uh, you, you would think at some point that there would, as someone who was a parent, right? She, she was a parent. She was concerned about her child. She knew the Myers. She knew the uh, mental state of Megan. You would think that there would be some level of empathy and compassion, but there was not. Lori Drew and Ashley Brills, who I believe she was 18 years old? 18 or 19 at the time. I can't recall exactly. Okay, so they established this boy character. How did they lure Megan into this relationship? Well, they started messaging Megan using essentially what is a uh, predecessor to Facebook Messenger, and they, they started to reach out to her, lure her back to his profile, uh, and then get it to the point where they... You, you can you can almost picture it, right? They're they're sitting behind the computer screen, 
saying things to a 13 year old girl that would make her feel cared for, or, you know, that a boy was interested in her, it hit its mark, unfortunately, and it became very enamored with the boy. What was Ashley's motivation? Ashley made it very clear, actually, at one point to Lori Drew that she was concerned that they could get in trouble, but she apparently lacked the comment, and, and Lori's response was, we won't, usually not, you know, not enough to insulate you from, uh, from getting into trouble. But Ashley had worked for the, for the Drews and, and decided to go along with it. It really was apparent that Lori needed someone like that. Ashley was more familiar with these types of online platforms in order to assist in, in what it was that she wanted to carry out. How far did the relationship between Megan and Josh go? Well, it got to the point where it appeared that Josh was interested in meeting with Megan. And so it was really at the point where it seemed, you know, there was some sexual references in the conversation, but it was readily apparent that Megan loved the attention and thought that this boy was interested in her. And it seemed like that a relationship was developing. And what was the turning point? What went sour? There was no real turning point other than it it appeared as if the fake individual was very interested in her. And then there was a fatal text where Josh sent an email uh, or a message to her saying that the world would be much better off with her out of it. So a 50-year-old woman sends a child that message. And literally within a day, uh, Megan took her own life. How did she take her life? She hung herself. I can't imagine what this little girl was going through. Devastating. How did this get out? I mean, who discovered this sickening plot? The St. Louis, Missouri authorities, the St. Louis, Missouri State Police as well, investigated the death while they ultimately ruled it a suicide, they did do uh, a, an investigation of her online behavior. And at that point, back in 2006, we didn't have the tools then that we have now, but they were able to piece this together as to what it was that, who she was conversing with in and around the time period of her taking her own life. Other people came forward and indicated that Mrs. Drew had, uh, in fact, talked about this at the, down at the local hair salon and didn't seem too concerned about it. And so they, the authorities uh, investigated it, knew that she had been bullied, and they, they did what they could in terms of looking for a possible vehicle to bring charges against Lori Drew, but... The problem was, was that at the time, like a lot of jurisdictions, Missouri did not have a cyberbullying statute that applied. I remember reading in the paper uh, while I was sitting in my office up in the 15th floor of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles, which we'll get to next, the fact that they couldn't find a cyberbullying statute that fit and that Ms. Drew was ultimately just going to get away with this. And so it started me thinking. How did you feel when you picked up the newspaper and read about this case? When I read about the story, it was, to me, it was just devastating. As someone who had, at that time, a middle schooler, a girl, you know, knowing what it's like to be the parent of someone who is going through, you know, the awful experiences of growing up through middle school, I just couldn't imagine that there wasn't a way for us to figure something out. Did you say figure something out legally. This is a very interesting legal theory. Although the behavior is horrific, it's very hard to prove the nexus of criminal culpability here. It's very hard. You know, Gina will appreciate this. A lot of times in the cyber section, we were dealing with very novel criminal behavior 
the statutes and the tools that we were given were somewhat antiquated. And so we were constantly trying to figure out how we could utilize the tools that we were given and see if we could make an impact on this, you know, new emerging area of criminal behavior. And so I literally picked up the phone and called one of the cyber supervisors at the FBI in Los Angeles, who was a lawyer. And I said to him, I said, you know, this is the facts. Have you read about this case? Yes. I said, what if we thought about using the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act statute? Let us do some research. If we did some research and we thought that we had enough to open a case, would you guys be interested in pursuing the case on the investigative level? And the answer was absolutely. The public interest was such that this type of behavior had to be at some point recognized as being criminal. We did that research. I was lucky enough to have a U.S. attorney. I was the chief of the cyber division. I couldn't just do a case like this without you know, having the, the U.S. attorney at the time and very high levels of the FBI in agreement that we should take uh, a statute that was designed basically for computer hacking and utilize it in the context of someone who would essentially lie to get access to an online platform that could then be used for the purpose of criminal behavior. And that's ultimately what we did. What is it about you that you see something in the newspaper about this case and made you decide to do something this creative? I couldn't imagine what those parents were going through. The fact that they learned that their daughter who was going through something that a lot of teenagers go through and emerge and are fine, died essentially as a result in some way of the behavior of an adult who knew full well that this was a young lady who was suffering, you know, with, with some degree of mental illness. I couldn't imagine those parents not feeling with all the resources that we had at our disposal in law enforcement, that there was absolutely no avenue for them to pursue. This case happened in St. Louis, Missouri. You're a federal prosecutor with jurisdiction in the Central District of California. Do you want to explain how you had a dog in this fight? You know, as, as, as cyber prosecutors, we were used to prosecuting people all over the world. And uh, usually the way that we were able to get around that very tricky little legal concept of venue, (laughs) um, which required that there be some action within your district to proceed, we, we had MySpace, which at the time was part of Fox Interactive, uh, sitting very close to the FBI blocks away. And so the communications that were being sent, the logins, all those things going over the internet, ultimately were being resolved just blocks away from the FBI within the Central District of California. So we had venue. Now, there was an issue that we had to resolve with the prosecutors in St. Louis federal prosecutors in St. Louis, because we went to them, we said, Megan's in your district, the witnesses are in your district. We, we fully understand if you want to take the chance of this case, we understand that, that it's novel. They said, no, you know, you guys came up with it. And so that's fine. You, you proceed and go forward. We were very happy to hear that. We had to talk to the Department of Justice, the cyber crime section back at the Department of Justice and the Assistant uh, Associate Attorney General, and we pitched our theory of prosecution. Everyone agreed that there was a substantial interest in proceeding with the case, but they were concerned on legal grounds about whether or not the statute really fit what it was that we were trying to do. Now, here was our concept. The statute, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, says that you have to be on a network 
by unauthorized access or exceeding authorized access. Our theory was pretty simple. They didn't have authorized access by violating the contractual terms of service that Fox uh, Interactive and MySpace laid out for people to properly use the platform. That theory had been used in various different hacking cases before. The, the concern though was the second prong, which is usually once you get on the network, you have to do a variety of different things. You have to obtain information. Usually that information has some value. Um, it's used a lot in the context of intellectual property crime theft, theft of trade secrets. You have to do damage to the network. You get on, you either acquire information, you damage the network intentionally in some way, or there was this other little prong that we read and we kept thinking to ourselves, what does this actually mean? Which is you exceed authorized access or you get on by you know unauthorized access and you intend to commit an intentional tort. What was the tort here? The tort here was emotional distress and we felt we had enough to proceed. There's no greater infliction of emotional distress than a 50 year old woman bullying a 13 year old child that she knows suffers from mental illness. Right. I mean, we, that's exactly the way we felt. And at the end of the day, the department of justice agreed with us, even they couldn't come up with a reason why not to do it. You know, they recognized that the case was a risk. We all know as prosecutors and investigators that risk doesn't mean that it's not meritorious. It just means that, you know, there is risk in the sense of, look, a judge or jury could find that this particular charge does not fit because we're talking about the early days of, you know, cyber crime. And so we all recognize that and, and we're prepared to move forward. What did you end up charging? So we charged the unauthorized access of a computer network, that being MySpace, and the uh, uh, intentional, uh, for the purpose of committing an intentional tort, which was emotional in infliction of emotional distress. Did you charge Ashley? No. So we, we felt that Ashley was a very beneficial witness because she was the insider, if you will. And so while we very much toyed with the idea of adding her as a co-conspirator of the case, we ultimately decided that we would give her immunity in exchange for testimony. And she testified against Lori Drew. Was it difficult for you not to charge Ashley? Yes. Why? Because she was as culpable in many ways as Ms. Drew. But you know, the factors that weighed in her favor was her youth, her remorse. We all face things as prosecutors where your gut reaction is, yeah, I'm not sure I should let someone off the hook given what the consequences of their actions are. But ultimately we wanna make the strongest case possible and you gotta, you gotta lead with your head and not necessarily with your gut. What happened at the trial? At trial, the jury ultimately convicted Ms. Drew of a misdemeanor. There was a misdemeanor 1030 violation, which was the unauthorized access of a computer network for the purposes of obtaining information. Then there was a substantial amount of briefing after trial because the judge identified the same concern that a lot of people did, which was is this hacking statute appropriate for this particular type of case? And while I felt we had the better argument, um, the judge will ultimately dismiss the conviction. When it came time for appeal, uh, because of a variety of concerns about what, what the circuit court of appeal would do with the statute, given the way that it was used, they decided not to appeal the case. How did that make you feel? I was angry. I was angry. I think they should have stuck by it, but I understand that they are driven by considerations that are not 
necessarily the same as mine, but at the end of the day, I do feel like Ms. Drew received a heck of a lot of attention for the conduct that she inflicted on Megan's family and Megan herself. And so there was some degree of satisfaction in knowing that at least the behavior was recognized as something that was wrong. And the consequence of that particular case was that many jurisdictions, and now I don't think you can find a jurisdiction that doesn't have an appropriate cyberbullying statute that would fit this type of behavior moving forward. So the law changed. The law changed as a result of this case. And I, you know, whether it was us, whether it was other good people who said, you know, enough is enough here and the internet is exploding and all these kids are on it. There's a very dark side of the internet for people who, you know, want to sit in their basement and um, control uh, for people who are emotionally vulnerable. Whatever it was, as a result of, in part of this case, I think that we, you know, we were able to get the message out and people listened and they, and they changed the law. As a result of Megan taking her own life, what was the fallout that came from that? Lori Drew was a pariah in her community. She had to move from the community, which I didn't particularly feel too sorry for her because she still had a life to lead but people paid attention now to the fact that th their children were involved in something that everyone thought was very innocent behavior. But the fact of the matter is, is that like anything, that innocent behavior can become extremely dark, especially when you inject an adult into a situation where they have access to children's communications. Mike, I know that you put a ton of effort into this case. I know the FBI agents put a ton of effort, your office, my office. After all these years that have gone by in this case, what still haunts you about it? I really feel the judge made the wrong call in dismissing it. What haunts me is that I still think that children are extremely vulnerable to all kinds of different predators on the internet. And I don't think that we police our kids like we should. And, you know, there's a very, very dark side to online activity. I don't think we ever could have imagined it at the time that MySpace seemed so innocent when it was launched. But, you know, now the, now the behavior is ingrained and endemic in every kid who can hold a iPad. But the, the image of that family, what, what happened to that family was just devastating. And it still is something that I think about a lot. And it, it is the dark side of humanity that, you know, we all, we all as prosecutors and investigators see, but you, you just, the worst is when someone's as vulnerable as a child ends up being the victim. You know, it's just, it's the most horrific type of crime to be involved with. And I don't think that Gina and I prosecuted a lot of cases involving child pornography and, and, you know, with a lot of child victims, but this, and that is horrific, but this one was so unbelievably specific and targeted at someone who you knew was vulnerable that it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. I think we can end on a high note. Can you talk a little bit more or explain a little bit more about how cyber laws were created as a result of this event? Well, I think you see, you know, you, you see a proliferation of criminal laws that are more designed to combat online behavior. You see California passing not only cyber bullying statutes, cyber stalking statutes, but also revenge porn statutes, which is a huge problem that no one really talks about or even realizes. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are a couple of universities that uh, university law schools that have d dedicated, you know, substantial resources and clinics to, to that type of behavior, which is very much a bullying, stalking, harassment type of behavior, uh, similar types of mindsets. So I think there has been a tremendous uptick in awareness of legislators 
who you know now want to make sure that their citizens are protected from this type of conduct. And I think you also see that there is a great deal of change in the attitude of how we view privacy, you know, more generally. You know, that there actually is a concern about privacy and you see California uh, leading the nation in its California Consumer Protection Act, uh, you know, uh, the breach laws, the, those sorts of things where privacy in general is being more paid attention to and protected and, uh, and then the bad online behavior is being looked at, investigated, prosecuted on a much more regular and consistent basis. Mike, hearing you talk just makes me so proud of prosecutors and so proud of investigators and FBI agents. And this case took courage. It took courage legally. It took courage emotionally. And that makes you a hero. Oh, thank you. You guys know it is not about individual efforts. It's about team collective efforts and people who are willing to support the vision that you have for putting a case together and seeing it through. Thank you. So Tracy, after listening to this, I can see the look on your face that you are not a happy camper. I am not. And I am not a happy camper. What about this incenses you the most? What gets you going the most? That people use technology and the internet to specifically target vulnerable kids. Yes. Well, and the fact that this monster knew that this little girl had mental health issues, I think that's an issue. I think that people are still cyberbullying in such a way today, however many, 14 years later, 15 years later, and it's such a common thing that people aren't even taking into consideration the impact that it has on the individual. I think people sometimes feel safe to say things on the internet or do things on the internet that they would never do in real life. And it's very similar to all crime, Gina, because the predators pick on the less, the those that are seen more vulnerable, that can't fight back for themselves or don't understand what's going on. And that, I think, is what makes me so angry about this case. Plus, I think the gang mentality, where it's, in this case, it was two against one, or you had a community because Lori Drew was out there telling other people this is what she was doing. So it was a gang mentality against this 13-year-old little girl who may or may not have said something bad about Lori Drew's daughter. And, and really, that's what it is. You know, when cyberbullying takes place, say, in a high school or online or on Instagram or any other social media platform, you know, people pile on. And you don't know who's walking in those shoes of the individual that is getting piled on against. She's 13 years old and she's just probably starting to like boys or and to, to do be so manipulative to make it about a boy liking her and then having him break her heart. It's really, really hard to listen to, but it's still going on today. Well, and I think it's important to bring out some statistics when it comes to cyberbullying. Um, I think you've got them there. What, 20 to 30 percent of kids say that they have uh, been reported as having been cyberbullied in their lifetime? Yes, and 10% of kids actually report being a cyber bully themselves, self-admitting it. So you know that number is way higher. Yep, and then there are reports that 95% of teens have access to a smartphone, making this such a common tool for cyber bullying. Just to make false and really mean statements about other people. And it's interesting to know why the cyber bullies do it. So why don't you tell us why? Well, they usually do it for revenge. They have anger and resentment built up themselves or to exert authority. It makes them feel powerful when they hide behind the technology and not face to face with people. Sometimes it's just boredom. Sometimes it could be by accident, you know, really not a malicious intent, but the impact on the victim doesn't change. That's correct. And I think the worst thing that the victim can do is to respond because if they don't respond then there's really nothing for the troll or there's nothing for the aggressor to do about it 
because they're not going to continue or maybe they will continue, but then they're going to get tired of continuing to go after the same person if they don't get a response because really that's what they're looking for, right? Absolutely. And I think it's so important for parents to teach their kids that. And also I think it's important for parents to teach their kids that um, people aren't who they say they are on the internet. They pretend to be their friend or pretend. You can't verify through the internet that someone is actually another teenager responding. It could be very well be a predator. So don't talk to people you don't know. And in the event you are cyberbullied, make sure you save the evidence. You definitely may need it at a later date. Make sure you tell someone, you want to tell a friend, a relative, your parents, an adult that you trust. You want to use available tech tools. Um, you want to block the person who is bothering you. You know, a lot of times I've talked to a lot of people and they don't even think to block the person. You know, that's the last thing on their mind because they want to be part of the social experiment out there. They want to be part of social media. Uh, definitely block the person, report it to your social media platform. And if someone makes threats, you definitely want to consider taking that to the police or the authorities and get the end getting them involved. But one other thing that people should remember that this was not the first time a child has committed suicide. Another example of this was in 2018, where two 12-year-olds in Panama City, Florida, they were arrested for cyberbullying in connection to the death of uh, Gabriella Green, and she was a middle-aged school student who committed suicide as a result of this cyberbullying. So what are the signs um, that parents need to watch out for that their child is being bullied? If their child all of a sudden doesn't want to look at their computer or their cell phone or any technical devices, we know that should be a big red flag, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. If they appear stressed or have an emotional reaction when they get a text message or an email, if they're withdrawing, this is signs for all kinds of um, possible victimization, but if they're withdrawing from friends or acting reluctant, they don't want to go to school or they don't want to go to social events or they don't want to talk about their computer or their computer use or they show signs of self-esteem or fear or depression, if they have problems sleeping or eating, those are the things parents should really look for. Yes, and we both worked Crimes Against Children. I worked Crimes Against Children over the internet. I was in charge of it for five years. I think the biggest tip that I can give for parents know what your kids are doing on the internet. And there are no rules that parents aren't supposed to check up on their kids. Uh, in fact, when you give your kid a cell phone or a, a laptop or any sort of digital device, you should have some sort of an agreement, a written agreement with them. And part of that is to let them know that you're monitoring their behavior on the internet. So make sure that the kids are using the devices in a common area in the house so you can kind of oversee what they're doing. And also make sure that they know that you can take those devices at any time and have a little look-see. And uh, spyware is not a no-no, in my opinion. You can look at whatever it is. If you're paying for it, I think you should be able to look at it. And I think that parents, so many times when, when um, I worked with the gang prevention program, I would tell parents, they don't have a right to privacy from you. Yeah, the kids don't. The kids don't have a right to privacy from the parents. That's right. And they need to know where their kids are all the time mm -hmm. and know what they're doing all the time. That's right. Random checks and spyware is fantastic because it's not only because you think your kids might be doing something wrong, but your kids might be a victim and not feel comfortable telling you. And that's how you can tell. Even if you have a great child that um, you're confident isn't doing any cyberbullying, they might be a victim and not comfortable to tell you. So do those checks. Get that spyware. Yes. And for all the uh, young people who are rolling their eyes at us right now and uh, who may not particularly care <laughs> for us right now, uh, your safety is our number one priority. And we want to make sure that you're safe because there's a lot of people out there who want to take advantage of you. And we just want to make sure that that doesn't happen. We'll see you next time on Behind the Crime Scene. More information about dealing with cyberbullying can be found on the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's website. Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS Special Agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com. And don't miss an episode. 
Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.